Over 7 million different animals inhabit our planet. Talking about wolves particularly just is amazing. So obviously we had to do this species this week. It was just a, a fascinating look back at these animals. What can they teach us? Because they're this highly organized social structure, they, they just have, they have to be able to communicate. And they communicate, obviously, different than you or, you or I, like we might wave. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast, Angie. Oh, hey, Chris. <laughs> There's nothing better than that sound. Ugh. I know, I know. Wolves are just Beautiful. Majestic. It's music. Oh, my goodness. They are amazing. They are amazing, and we finally got to come back to, to wolves. You know, yes. we've, we did Red Wolves way back when. That was literally 90 episodes ago. So, wow. quite a, yeah, quite a I was going to say, it doesn't ago. feel like just yesterday, but I don't know if it feels 90 episodes worth, but yeah, yes, Chris, digging into the literature and just going through the behavior, I, I felt, I fell in love again. It's like, they're just such an amazing animal and probably because they remind us of our pets at home or Fido's mm -hmm. or for me, my gypsy, gypsy jazz, Gigi, she's got like a million names, mm -hmm. but just the behavior and the beauty. I could look, I could look at wolves all day. Um, so I watched a lot, of, of course, yeah. a lot of videos this week in prep, probably more than I was reading just because they're just so easy on the eyes, at least for me. No, they are. They are. And, you know, going to gray wolves, we did red wolves way back when, thanks to our friend, Autumn Lindy, who reached out to us and said, Hey, Hi, you Autumn. have to do this. Yes. Yeah, I know we have to do this. Make species. sure and tell us what we get wrong today. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I mean, you know, we did red wolves. So, we, you know, we get a, we get a brush up on the gray wolf. We're going to kind of focus and then you know, talk about wolves around, around the planet, but we've, we really had to do these as soon as possible. And also because we do have a special episode coming out Thursday with Corbin Maxey. We just recorded that last week with him talking about the wolf issue in the Western United States and, and, and really the hunting of wolves, how wolves are being persecuted in the United States. Yeah, the just the, the human wolf conflict. It's uh, as old as time. Right. And in some ways not getting any better. So, no, no. Yeah. And it, it was timely. It was, it was timely because we recorded that with Corbin. And then the next day, the Trump administration comes out and talks about stripping or making broad changes to the Endangered Species Act. So sweeping not, changes, sweeping changes, and not for the good. No, no, and <laughs> stripping. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really really horrific, actually. And you know, reading the news about it, you know what the Trump administration and the Department of Interior here in the United States is proposing. These changes are expected to go into motion next month. And basically, it's going to reduce protections for endangered species and make it easier for companies to, to build roads, mines, and really oil and gas on critical habitat that's protected. So mm -hmm. when you say it's not about the money, it's about the money, this is all about the money. It's all oh, about profit. It's so all about the money. Yeah. Yeah. And it was shocking, the headlines that were coming out just about the different species and what they were talking about doing from salmon mm -hmm. to uh, for them losing some of their protections up in Alaska to of course using cyanide bombs mm -hmm. uh, bringing those back for uh, wolves in particular yeah. uh, but coyotes and things like that and just just a lot like a, a few headlines every day and then what 
really made me feel good is that shortly thereafter, some people really stood up. Mm -hmm. Uh, People with big names like Jeff Corwin, Mm -hmm. Stephanie Arney, Mm -hmm. and Jane Goodall, and several others. I can't mention all the names. Uh, But just people with a lot of fouling really bringing attention to what the administration is trying to do to the ESA or the Endangered Species Act. And at least some good news on the front of, I know the administration has pushed aside the cyanide bombs, those types of traps for wildlife due to the public outcry. Tens of thousands of people signed letters, contacted their state representatives. And so that that speaks volumes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you know, people want to get voted into office again. And they know if they are making a whole bunch of people angry, they are going to listen. Right. Uh, not every time, but all we can do is try. And so uh, keep being conservation heroes. Uh, check your social media or maybe follow some of these people that are – staying current with issues and have a bigger platform. And we always try to help and, and encourage our listeners to uh, get involved and and uh, participate. Because you can. You can participate with, in this day and age from home, from your couch, just by writing letters, calling people, signing petitions, things like that, donating to groups that are working hard to do that. So, yeah, um, hopefully, hopefully we can keep pushing back right, and- because it's so unnecessary. It is, and it's, it shouldn't be a partisan issue, you know, here in the United States or whatever country you're in. I mean, at this point in history, especially in the news the last few years, you know, not only the oceans, but the UN comes out with a million species under threat of extinction just a few months ago. We need to be protecting our habitats, not destroying them for profit, period. That only benefits a few people. And Exclamation mark, Chris. <laughs> right, right. So Multiple it was timely. So, marks. So you're going to want to listen to that one on Thursday with Corbin. It was just, it was great. It was great talking to him again. He's, he's a special friend to Angie and I. And it was something we, we've actually been in the works for a few months. You know, with Corbin's busy schedule, he's going on a bunch of TV shows, touring around the country. So for us to, to sit down again and have a roundtable with him, talking about wolves particularly, just is amazing. So obviously we had to do this species this week. It was just a, a fascinating look back at these animals and then looking specifically at gray wolves and, and their history. So I'm excited to get to that here in a minute. Just really quick, couple announcements. You know, uh, you know, check us out on Patreon. We, we love our Patreon subscribers. We have a huge species coming for them next week. So, you know, stay tuned for that. And then Angie. Literally huge. <laughs> I, I see know. what you did there, Chris. <laughs> it's a, it's a huge. It, it's huge. It's huge. Yes. And, you know, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. But big news coming from Angie and I this week. The other day, we found out that we were actually nominated for a People's Podcast Choice Award in the science category. We made the cut. So we're one of the top Woo-hoo! 10. That, yeah. yeah. So wish us luck. There's. Not nothing you can do. They're, the voters are actually listening to the different podcasts. We're actually against a NASA podcast and a few other good That's ones. That's nuts. I know. Oh my gosh. I know. I know. So you know, wish us luck. And and then I want to give a shout out to my new good friend Mike from the LA Zoo. He's quickly becoming a good friend. You know, making some great contacts here in Southern California. You know, been uh, helping me out, making some uh, contacts with you know not only LA Zoo but San Diego Zoo. So shout out to Madison and Roxanne from the LA zoo and then Lauren from the San Diego zoo, you know, give her a big shout out too. So, you know, as, as our podcast continues to grow and we're making these contacts in industry, people out there fighting day in, day out for these animals. And it's really got me and Angie excited about, you know, some of the future interviews and collaborations that we're developing. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I'm, I'm just really excited, really excited uh, to be working with them. Now, Angie, last week we released Dr. Greg Rasmussen's interview about African painted dogs, and it just really got me thinking and excited about wolves because there's so much, so much in common with them. You know, not only... Yes. Yeah, the persecution that they went through and they're going through, you know, with gray wolves. You know, gray wolves were almost eliminated in the lower 48. In Mm -hmm. the United States, we, we call... You know, there's 50 states in the United States. We say the lower 48 is like the main bunch of us. Then you have Alaska and Hawaii. So for our international listeners, when we say lower 48, those are the states that are right under Canada. 
So the wolves were persecuted and hunted and, and killed. And there was just a few in Minnesota. And then just off Michigan, off an island, there were some wolves. And that was it until the Endangered Species Act came in. And then they've been reintroduced and they've been able to rehabilitate. Now, we know red wolves are almost extinct uh, in the Carolinas. We're fighting to save them. So these animals are still under a tremendous amount of pressure. Their population has gone up in the United States, but they've lost some of these protections in certain states. So farmers and ranchers are, are killing them or hunting them. And, you know, the interesting thing, Angie, you know, I just want to throw this out there. When looking at the data, you know, of cattle, let's say just say, cat, you know, ranchers that, that, that ranch cattle, wolves are responsible for less than 1% of their losses in the Western yeah, states. Yeah, it's a really small amount if you're doing head of cattle to, or uh, sheep for that matter as well, to predation by wolves. Cattle is, or and or sheep, livestock, is not going to be their first go-to prey. Uh, and so mm -hmm. the incidence of the human or the cattle or livestock conflict with wolves, although if you are a farmer, uh, of course, every, every dollar counts because we know that they are not making much money, but in the same instance, mm -hmm. it's not this huge number, uh, in my opinion, as far as to to equate the outcry or this um, this attack on on wolves, because wolves used to be in the entire lower forty eight in New Mexico. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I mean they dominated. Yeah. They dominated, and mm -hmm. so. I don't know. Obviously, they could probably never go back to the historic locations. We're not going to find them in New York City. Right. Although I did see a really mm -hmm. cool picture of a coyote. And I think it was in, I don't know if it was in Manhattan or um, or maybe it might have been in the Bronx. But I believe it was right. you know, in a very, very, you know, in a populous part of New York. And it was just up there on top of a dumpster. And somebody, you know. <laughs> we caught it. So, but I, I don't know if I, I don't see gray wolves ever getting there. And at the rate that we're going after them, uh, definitely not. But I do think that they deserve to be in their home range, especially because we brought them back when mm -hmm, they're basically mm -hmm. extinct from the lower 48 with the help of the federal gov government and scientists we relocated some gray wolves from Canada into Yellowstone to mm -hmm. rehabilitate that ecosystem of and that predator prey interaction of the elk and the wolves. And, and it was hugely successful as far as mm -hmm. on so many fronts. And Chris and I talk a lot about that in, in our uh, podcast with Corbin. So I won't go into too much, too much details, but, it was it, it was hugely beneficial both to the environment, to the elk population as far as helping uh, trim down the sick and the elderly and, and the disease and things like that. But then also for for economical purposes for for all the tourism it brought in. And we go over the numbers in the podcast, but millions and millions of dollars are bought, brought in because people love wolves. For as many people that are not for wolves, not due to the predation of livestock or wanting their land to lay down their pipelines or whatever it is. I believe in my heart of hearts, there's probably more people that actually really love wolves. They're just maybe not as vocal or they don't have as much power. But what people are doing is they're voting with their dollar by going to Yellowstone and some of these other places where you can see wolves exhibiting natural behavior in the wild. And that's generating mm -hmm. a lot of money. And so- yeah. Yes, and so in that because of that, populations of gray wolves in the lower 40 in North America have, to some extent, rebounded. But there's only 6,000 total, and that's across Idaho, Montana, Colorado, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, Washington, Oregon, uh, yeah. Washington. Yeah, it's a huge and, and range. And a few in California, right? That's a new update that uh, a few right. pups were recently born like the first ones born into california that didn't just like cross over right, right. northern california yeah, so they yep. might be coming your yeah, way soon yeah. chris you can only hope it, good good but that's good. if people yeah. keep expressing the fact that they want 
the Endangered Species? Because, I mean, maybe, Chris, you can explain it just briefly about the Endangered Species Act, because I know you're a buff about it. And it gave gray wolves protection, right? Yeah, it did. It did. And I'll go into it real quick. So it was passed in 1973 by a Republican, you know, who's uh, in the United States, President Nixon. I wish I had a Nixon impression, but I don't. (laughs) So, you know, it was a little predating my time. Yeah, but it was a bipartisan issue. It was it was agreeing to protect our wild spaces and our wildlife. They they saw that what was going on in the early 70s and the 60s and said we need to protect it. So they passed the Endangered Species Act and because that has affected economic development in certain industries or certain areas of the country, people have thrown up their arms and go, "Oh, I can't make money because of this turtle or this tortoise or this, this salmon." Yeah, or this endangered bird you know that's wrong i should be able to make as much money as i want and they're like no you know we're in a global biodiversity crisis we are in a huge crisis on every continent and in the oceans and this isn't the time to be removing restrictions on endangered species because once you know as angie and i've said over a hundred plus podcast episodes once that food web starts breaking down you know it's going to affect many 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 ecosystems, you know, from the ground up and wolves are critical to that, critical to that ecosystem. Yeah. And so definitely check out the podcast with uh, Corbin as far as discussing wolves and, um, and the conflict with them. But in a nutshell, when the species is protected by the endangered species act, it's really federally protected. And so a lot of groups are coming in or certain groups are coming in and saying like their populations up to 300 here in Idaho or 200 over here in whatever um, state. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we think they need to be delisted. And Chris and I discussed a little bit, but basically for many years, it's gone back and forth in different states and regions of people getting the gray wolf delisted. So therefore Mm -hmm. then they can be hunted or Mm -hmm. culled. Um, And then people saying, no, 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 that, that that's not right. And then taking it to another judge in a different court higher up and then mm-hmm. they are like, oh yeah, they that they weren't following all the law, and so then it gets they get relisted back on mm-hmm. the Endangered Species Act, and then they're safe for a while, and then more people come at them, and then they get delisted and relisted, and it's just this um, this kind of back and forth, and so in some places they have been delisted, and people are able to um, hunt them according to their own state regulations, and then in other places they're not, and even that's but that's uh, they're all, it's always currently in some legal battles. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. we talk a lot about gray wolves in the podcast and this whole conflict, but in summary, I think the question really shouldn't be, are you for wolves or against wolves? Cause that seems to be what the battle is. Uh, as a scientist and an optimist and all of us who have this conservation conscientious, I think the question should be, how can humans and wolves better coexist? Right, right. That's right. where the money yeah. needs to be. That's where the science needs to be. Whether we're paying farmers out for loss of cattle, whether we're putting in different fences for sheep or hiring more people to help protect the the cattle at nighttime or making sure that the wolf's range is theoretically as far away from possible as roaming livestock. I don't have any of the answers. I just know that there has to be a better way. And here in the United States, out of all the, you know, the land of innovation, I feel as though we could meet somewhere in the middle uh, as, as they did in 74, whenever they, when they pass this endangered species act. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. And I think, you know, we summarize it really well and, and just listen to that one on Thursday. We're, Today, what we're setting up really is the the history of the wolves and, you know, their physiology, their behavior. Like Angie has a big question, I was going to say, my goal is today, anybody who is just thinks wolves are either just okay or not good, I want you to fall in love with them. And hopefully that's my goal because they are just really cool. They're part of our history. They're an important part of the ecosystem. They're stunning to look at. They're intelligent creatures. My gosh, we have their cousins basically 
running our lives, right? <laughs> like who's right, training right. who? Living with I, us. Yeah, I know yeah. my dog trains me, right? So yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. and oh, and or of course, there's going to be tons of people that are already on the same boat as you and I that are madly in love with wolves, like Autumn and her mm-hmm. whole team. But I, I guess hope, hopefully the podcast can help get other people excited about wolves that maybe aren't as familiar with their um, with their natural history and their behavior. So. And that, with that being said, I always grew up a child of the 80s, and my favorite animal, besides a horse, was a timber mm-hmm. wolf. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But now that I've been studying this, I realize that there's a lot of common names for the gray wolf, and one of them is a timber yeah. wolf, or mm-hmm. a white wolf if they're in the Arctic, or sometimes mm-hmm. just a common wolf. So they are a species that is found all over. It's world, complex. not just here in North it's, America. Uh, it's complex. I, I, I'm going to get to it in a minute. They, uh, a very interesting natural history and uh, the subspecies. Oh, yeah. The species, I'm going to let you tackle that because, <laughs> like I said, I'm just like, I just pretty much spent the week preparing for this by watching videos of their behavior and uh, falling mm-hmm. in love. So, uh, and with that being said, too, you're going to want to stay tuned because my question of the day for you to, for you to think about uh, while this podcast is airing is, do wolves really howl at the moon? Yeah, I don't know. A, a lot of weird things happen exhibit? at the moon, yeah. With full mm-hmm. moon, a lot of weird stuff if, goes on. Yeah. So. And if so, and if so, why? So stay mm-hmm. tuned. We'll cover that in behavior and a lot of other really cool things as far as their hunting strategies. And yeah, they're just awesome. Yeah. So wolves, I mean, just a quick description, huge dogs. Uh, They're the large, the gray wolves are the largest canid. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. They're huge. They're huge. And you have a mix of gray, brown, but even dark or almost black, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Really cool. You know, some facial markings sometimes or black tips on their ears and their feet. Cinnamon in color. I love that. Cinnamon highlights. (laughs) I want cinnamon highlights. So one thing I, I I ran across I thought was interesting. If we go back to Fennec Fox, do you remember Bergman's rule? I don't know if you ran across that. Remember the two rules I talked about size of animals? So Bergman's rule. Well, it's based on, yeah, like the land, the area that they inhabit. Right. And the right. amount of food. Well, that. And then so the Bergman's rule is basically based on climate, Right. Mm-hmm. So northern latitudes, the higher north or or even south, you know, for, for certain species down there. But let's just say wolves will stick in the northern hemisphere. The farther north you go, are they bigger or smaller? Bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was Bergman's rule was basically stating that animals in colder climates tend to be bigger to better thermoregulate, protect that body core temperature. So wolves in the north, the farther north you go, the bigger they are. So as you get close to the Arctic Circle, they are they're they're large. They're very large. So some of the sizes, you know, uh, European wolves they they put eighty five pounds on average, or thirty eight and a half kilograms. North American wolves seventy nine pounds, thirty six kilograms. Then a couple that we'll get to once we get to subspecies, the Indian or Arabian wolves. They're smaller at fifty five pounds or twenty five kilograms. Yeah, it's pretty small. Yeah, even the red wolf we know is smaller. You know, oh, yeah, The red wolf smaller than their yeah. cousins. Yeah my, yeah, my gypsy girl, she's about, I probably shouldn't say her weight on the air, uh, <laughs> but she's, I think she's about 73 pounds. So she's, yeah, like, so she's, she's, she's like living with a, not quite an Arctic wolf, but uh, yeah, maybe she's there. Like a, she's there. Yeah, she's there. <laughs> now they stand almost three feet at the shoulder, 85 centimeters, over five feet in length or, or 160 centimeters, tails up to 20 more inches or 50 centimeters. So, you know, pretty, pretty long nose to tail. I mean, pretty long. And for our listeners in North America, they're readily distinguishable from the coyote because they right. are they're 50 to hundred percent larger and they definitely have a broader snout, larger feet. Uh, the coloration theoretically can be the same and with that, that cinnamon brown tan color, mm-hmm. but yeah, the size is what's really going to uh, be different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Much, much, much bigger. Now, Angie did talk about the range. Now, this was very kind of eye-opening to me. You know, I knew they did range all over the United States down into Mexico. 
mm-hmm. you know, Baja, California, there in Florida, where you're at, obviously in California, where I'm at. So in the, in North America, they were found everywhere. Mm-hmm. Now today, like we said, in the lower 48, there's a small pocket that I'm going to talk about in Arizona, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And then we have some in the, in the Western US that we've talked about, you know, not only in, in your old stomping grounds of Michigan, Minnesota, but also, you know, the Western states, Washington, Oregon, stuff like that that you've talked about. Now we go either across the Pacific or across the Atlantic. So for our international listeners that, you know, wolves in their backyard, especially our, our listeners in Sweden, you know, mm-hmm. we've got a, oh, yeah. a great listenership in Sweden. So, you know, you find some there, pockets of Sweden and Norway, Finland, pretty much all of, of Russia, parts of Europe. Now, historically, wolves were found pretty much everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. Sure. China, India, the Arabian Peninsula, North Africa. We've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. Now, today, very few pockets in Europe and still pretty much in Asia you know, not as much in China, India, there's still pockets and and parts of there. Now they don't range all the way down into Southeast Asia. You know, you're not talking Vietnam, Thailand. It's just, well, it's not good wolf territory, Right. you know, not, not good at all. And in Japan, they used to be in Japan Mm -hmm. too, but no longer. So huge historical range. I mean, huge. And obviously humans have, have pushed them out. And then again, coming back to North America, they range all throughout Canada and Alaska and, and stay tuned when I get to conservation, I'll talk about some of their populations uh, there today. So still doing, doing okay in the, in the great white North here in Greenland too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, found almost everywhere. Now we've kind of hammered why care, you know, and, and I think we can kind of maybe leave that on for Thursday, you know, why we care about them. We, we do a pretty good job hammering that, but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just briefly, they're top predators. They're apex predators. They regulate populations of their prey animals, which is really important. Their prey animals are often going to be herbivores, such as elk and deer, and things that can really populate quickly and devastate landscapes as far as the greenery grows, the the bushes, the trees, saplings, things like that. And from an economic perspective, they were very important back in the day, trading furs, things like that. Of course, that's not a, that's not allowed anymore, but they're just embedded in our culture from, and not only in the United States, in, in cultures wherever their home range was or is. As far as symbolism and stories and folklore and myth, uh, music, and I think it is because of our our close connection to them yet, of course, there's some fear, right? Uh, Whether they're Mm -hmm. howling at the moon or we have in the United States, we have a a werewolf myth of a half man, half wolf kind of scary type thing. So they're just, they're just so popular. I mean, that's where it's, it's hard for me to know how people can't love them. But I also know if your livelihood is is farming and livestock and things like that. And you're, and you come across wolves all the time. It's easy for me here in Florida where I don't come across wolves all the time. I get very excited if I see a fox or a coyote or something like that to say that it would be awesome to have wolves in my backyard. But for those, Mm -hmm. for a lot of our listeners that are in the the Northwest that actually have them in not their backyard, but have them nearby, it, it, it's probably is a little bit more, either disconcerting or you have to do things a little bit differently. So, but hands down, people love them. People will pay money to see them. Gray wolves increase the tourism at Yellowstone National Park here in North America. Um, It's estimated that it boosted local economies by $5 million per year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's also talked about that wolf watching or watching their behaviors and the dynamics and knowing which individuals, which brings in four times the amount of money that hunting would. Because of course, hunting, if we're thinking about from an economical point of view, does bring in some money, revenue as well. But the wolf watching actually brings in about four times more are, are the recent estimates. And so why care about them, Chris? If, 
if you don't like looking at them, they can make a lot of money if they're in your area. <laughs> so, uh, I, and they're important too for, like I said, their ecosystem role. And, and we talk a lot about it in, with our, and with Corbin about their role in the ecosystem and how wolves coming back to Yellowstone really dynamically change landscape everywhere from the, of course, the elk population, but then as well as beavers and they change the plants and the trees and therefore the birds and the waterways and the soil. And so uh, it's just, they're really important. Uh, having They're critical. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a, critical. having a, an apex predator is a good thing in an ecosystem. Yeah, you need it. it it's mm-hmm. the way it is, you know, and mm-hmm. it's, it, it's, you know, we... We say nature, and it's so funny because this is the one thing I took out of Greg Rasmussen's uh, interview. He said something, you know, when he was talking about opening up with the story about Circus and Ulna, which you have to listen to if you haven't. And he was mentioning, what is nature today? You know, he's all, what is nature? He, he states it. And it's such a great question because we have impacted the ecosystems around the planet, period. We're finding trash in the Mariana Trench. Like we've touched every ecosystem on earth. You know, even even Antarctica is now being exploited. So anyways, totally agree. Very important, you know, how, how critical these animals are. Now, Angie, jumping into their natural history. This was fun. So <laughs> strap on your seatbelts and let's talk a little bit about wolves and then i want to talk a little bit about domestication for of dogs our, our favorite pets so this is what surprised me there are 38 subspecies of wolves to include to include gypsy is a wolf she I is a it. wolf <laughs> i knew it in sheep's clothing no. <laughs> yes she is yes She's a subspecies of wolves. I love her so much. I just want to kiss her face right now. I don't know if that's a normal <laughs> I know. thing or not, but no, I said it on I know, air. I know. It's true. But so is a chihuahua is a wolf. <laughs> that's so. a little harder to buy, but I, under- I understand <laughs> genetics enough to know that I, that is true. But yes. <laughs> it's true. A chihuahua is a wolf. I cannot think of a chihuahua all- right now that I want to kiss on the face, but I know our listeners <laughs> probably have some. And we'll give them yes. shout outs next time. So they are Canis lupus familialis, and we'll get to them a little bit. So they are a subspecies of wolf. You know, that's also the red wolves is a subspecies, the dingoes in Australia, eastern wolves. But of course, in science, it's all being debated now. You know, I don't, I don't know. Some scientists are debating it. But some of the other species of wolves that you might have heard of, the tundra wolf, Mongolian, Tibetan, Indian, Eurasian, steppe wolf, Arabian wolf, and others, some extinct. And then we have the gray wolves that we're, we're kind of focusing on today. Now, for gray wolves, there was some debate on how many species or subspecies of gray wolves there were. Generally accepted four to five. So I covered five, you know, that I would, I would say are, are gray wolves. So you have your mm-hmm. Arctic wolf, Canis lupus arctos, Northwestern wolf, which is Canis lupus occidentalis, Great Plains, which is C.L. Nublis, the Mexican wolf, which we'll talk a little bit about today too later, Canis lupus bailei, and the Eastern timber wolf, Canis lupus lycaon. So those are the, the, the major subspecies that they're generally agreeing on. You know, again, when we say scientists are debating this, go back to we're in this genetic revolution right now. So as people studying these animals look at the genetics more closely compare genes they're able to evaluate these these family trees and kind of come up with different consensus so that's what's going on it's you know initially they would just do it by by looks and and measurements things like that skull measurements were a big one teeth but now that we have genetics we're able to more closely align certain subspecies and say no they're they're really one species together, one subspecies together. So they'll combine them instead of breaking them out into all these different little ones that they had. Now in our, you know, we just did fennec fox. We've, we've done some canids. So we've done some evolution on that. Just quickly, quick review. Everything goes back to the myocids, you know, evolved in North America 35 million years ago. This is what gave us bears, mustelids, pinnipeds, things like that. 
seven to eight million years ago, the canids moved into Asia, then down into South America. Now, wolves are interesting because they went a little bit different as far as where they evolved. So gray wolf is Canis lupus. That's their scientific name. And the question is, when did they split off, right? When did a wolf become a wolf? So it was somewhere between four and a half and nine million years ago. So during the Miocene okay. era, yeah. long wow. time ago, long time mm-hmm. ago, is where the ancestors of wolves split off. So you had wolves and foxes. So foxes split off to, to go form their group and the wolves uh, split off to their group. Now, about 1.8 million years ago, wolves in North America, the wolves that were here at the time, had split from coyotes and looked pretty much what they look like today, but those were the dire wolves, which I know you were like, they're real? Yeah, I'm- <laughs> dire wolves were real. I know. Yeah. I know. We should have done this for Game of Thrones. I know, I know, I know. So dire wolves actually did. I'm going I'm to cover dire wolves here in a second. So they, they actually did exist in North America. Now, gray wolves, they believe, evolved in Asia, not North America. Okay. So in North America, you had dire wolves. And then in Asia, you had gray wolves. And then around 700,000 years ago, they migrated back to North America. And then lived with dire wolves until the end of the ice age where the dire wolves went, you know, they went extinct. Sure. Okay. Okay. So then gray wolves remained. So very, very interesting history. Now, a big question I've had, and I've been wanting to cover this since red wolves, and we touched upon it a little bit then, but when did dogs become domesticated? You know, mm. our family wolves. That's what they and are. How? You know, you're, you're, I know there's a lot of theories about, or I guess there's two main circulating theories. Right. Yeah. And so I loved it when, so I don't know, a lot of people, we, we don't really push my book, but I did publish a horse book. You should book push at, your you know, book. I'm going to push it. Chris wrote a horse book. It's awesome. Buy it. <laughs> I have it right here. Yeah. It is called The Handbook of Horses and Donkeys, yeah. An Introduction to Ownership and Career by Chris Jay Mortensen. Thank you. And there's a picture of <laughs> Romeo you. in so there. So I wrote a so. book. <laughs> it's a little self-promotion too. And your picture's in there. Oh, snap. And Angie's picture's in there That's too. That's right. <laughs> you are. Some behavior stuff. But it was cool because when I wrote that book, I, I, I really loved learning about the history of horses. And then so I really investigated and searched on the domestication of horses. When did that happen? Where? What does science tell us today? And, and it was somewhere in Central Asia, right? About 10,000 years ago. So I have a lot of interest on domestic dogs because the theory is dogs were the first animal to be domesticated by humans or one of the very first. So what studies we're looking at is somewhere in China, Mongolia, or Europe. And it's a huge debate, obviously, in science. So so one of the most recent studies was published in, in 2017 in Nature. And it actually pushes back domestication, or this study argued that dogs were domesticated at least once. So there might have been multiple domestication events at least 20,000, if not 40,000 years ago. Wow. Yeah. So incredible. And yeah. Yeah. So this evolutionary ecologist out of Stony Brook University is arguing that chasing genetic mutation that they can estimate when dogs were first domesticated. And so that's what pushed back that timeline. And they argued that there was only likely one single domestication event in dogs. Okay. Okay. But obviously that's controversial because in other studies that they think dogs were domesticated more than once. And these researchers, a different study was looking at mitochondrial DNA from different dog breeds in Europe. And they estimated probably three to 14,000 years ago is when dogs really were starting to be domesticated at multiple places across uh, Northern Europe. I think Europe and uh, not just Northern Europe, all of Europe and Asia. So they're putting it about 14,000 years ago is when they think they were domesticated. Well, Chris, okay. That's you answered half my question. The other half is who domesticated who? Did we go out and pick up 
wolf pups that had been abandoned. That's what they think. But I've also heard That's what they think. that they think that wolves also may have domesticated themselves by right. coming right. closer to the right. human garbage. Because, well, why wouldn't you? I'm sure the, mm-hmm. I'm sure the human garbage back in the day was mm-hmm. pretty yummy with different leftover bones or meat right. or whatever the hunters and gatherers bones had. And, stuff, yep. and so the wolves that were brave enough to come closer and encroach more on human territory did genetically became more fit because they got better food. And that passed mm-hmm. down the line, that bravery, that kind of ability to live in and amongst the humans. And I just keep right. picturing him just kind of walking right up into the end of the tent or the, the hut or the cave and just, yeah, just camp. sitting down yeah. on the couch and being like, let's do this. Let's do this thing. You and me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, one of the most classical studies looking at this in animal behavior, and we've talked about it you know, way back when was the sure. fox study that looked at, you know, how long it took to domesticate a fox. And then the physiological changes they went through, you know, they got bushy tails, crook tails, their, their coats changed, anything like that. So what they did is they would t- select right, the friendliest. Right, of course. Or that was least fearful of humans. So, you know, if you're looking at who domesticated who, either humans took a friendly wolf pup and raised them and then that one stuck around and then they got another one and they bred and produced pups. And then it took about 50 generations to completely domesticate the foxes. That's probably how long it could take to domesticate the wolves into, you know, a friendly dog, wolf-like mm-hmm. dog that would stick around with the humans. So very fascinating work. I mean, the behavior stuff there. Is, yeah, we may is, never know. We may never know who if they no, of no. how exactly it went down. No, no. It's just, it's amazing to think about yeah. and just how that, that bond and how strong that bond sure. is today. Domestication of of dogs is is something fascinating. And maybe one day we can we can get somebody on here that that studies this. Sure, and, sure, and absolutely. It. There's, yeah. I mean, I, this is probably one of the longest podcasts I have prepared, and, and we won't have time to get all do it. But I think, yeah, I'm close to like thirty yeah. some slides. Or I just couldn't stop myself. Yeah. Just in, and when I get to behavior, I, I hope I don't disappoint, but I, I disappoint myself because there's so much that just to cover. Where I'm just going to give a shout out to a book and then. There's that. <laughs> if you want more, there's that. If you want more, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, we'll get to it. Man, oh, we'll get to it. We'll get yeah, to it. Let's get to it's it. It's just. Let's get to just, it. Uh, they're just so cool. I mean. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll speed up a little bit. So here, so we covered the the largest canine or canid. You know, we talked about in the painted dogs. It was the Epsion, but you know, big, not huge, not horse size, but pretty big, pretty big. Now I wanted to talk about dire wolves because dire wolves are really cool, and they were real. So it's, they weren't huge. Like in Game of Thrones, you saw these monster wolves that were just gigantic. They weren't like that. They were very much like the largest gray wolves you find today. So they were, they were big, big wolves. But what was so cool about the dire wolves, Angie, is their teeth. So their legs were shorter. They were heavier, but they had these teeth so they could crush bone. So if you look at what, dire wolves kind of looked like they were kind of shorter and squattier but just as muscular and heavy but they just had huge jaws and like a hyena yeah almost like a hyena almost like a hyena that's a good species to compare it to so they don't think they could have ran as fast as gray wolves or kept up with prey more that they scavenged on these megafauna like a dead mammoth or you know maybe some smaller calves or something like that or the woolly rhinoceros so they depended on those large megafauna. And when they died out with the ice age, so did the dire wolf. And then okay. that allowed gray wolves to, to flourish. So yeah, dire wolves are real. They just got <laughs> massive jaws. Now getting back to gray wolves, just really quickly, because we do want to get to behavior. We, that's a fascinating topic with them. It is in the wild, they live about eight to nine years. You know, and then under human care, they, they, they can live under typical dog lifespan 50, up to 15 years is, is what they normally lifespan is for them. Now, they often travel around. Hopefully, hopefully 20 for my gypsy girl. I know, we'll I know. See. Probably I, not. I wish, I wish they lived long. I, I know. Really wish they lived long. 
So when wolves are loping, you know, that's their traveling pace. They can go anywhere, you know, five to six miles an hour, eight kilometers per hour. And they can, they can maintain that for, for a long time. They can, they can go for, for a good, uh, good distance doing that. Now, when they're sprinting or running flat out, they can go almost 40 miles an hour or 64 kilometers per hour. So wow. they're, they're booking it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're booking it. But yeah. And they've been known, uh, of course, depending on the, the different packs or whatever, but uh, they do roam large distances and it can be up to 12 miles in a single day. Yeah. Yeah. They've got incredible stamina, just like the African painted dogs. I mean, they just, they, they go, they go, they go, they go. Yeah. Which is some of their hunting strategies as well. The marathon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. If you can't run faster now, than them, you've got to outrun them. Yeah. Right. They gotta last longer. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Now, uh, I, I read they can leap up to 16 feet across horizontally, so they can take a good jump. Their bite force was was interesting. I looked this up. So in comparison, top 20, one of the top 20 species, their bite force is 400 pounds per square inch. And, you know, pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, mountain gorilla, I think, was 800 pounds. The hippo has 1,800 pounds per square inch. Yeah, watch out. And our... And our champion, if you can remember, going way back, down under. Alligator snapping turtle? No, down under. Oh, <laughs> down under. the crocodile. Yeah, salty croc. 7,700 mm -hmm. pounds per square inch. So 7,700. Yeah. 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 That's they, why they they've been a... around for so long. Oh, they will probably yeah, outlive crazy. us, too. Yeah, I know. I know. Now, as Angie said, a group's a pack. And then you have the breeding pair, a breeding male and female, are the pack leaders. So, you know, they, they are the only two breeding. And then the rest of the pack are usually either, either offspring or relatives of them in the pack. So you have the subordinates in, in that pack. The youngs are pups. Now, again, you know, Angie's about to get to behavior and very similar to African painted dogs. I, I remember, you know, Dr. Rasmussen talking about they are not vicious as leaders of the pack. They don't fight to the top and maintain it. It's like maybe you think like a hyena clan would, or you know, matriarch and a hyena clan would, things like that. They, they are really, they're essential to that pack social structure. And Angie will get into a little bit of that. So I, I won't go into too much detail, but listening to Dr. Rasmussen talk about how critical those leaders are and then thinking about them getting shot or killed, it, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. We'll get to it to behavior, I guess, uh, here in a second. Yeah, and sometimes they're called the alpha, um, the alpha pack members, alpha male, alpha female. But I do think that sometimes, and the subordinates are sometimes called beta, things like that. But you make a really good point, and I think some some of the literature is trying to get away from alpha and beta just because of the fact that yeah, there's not this dominant. I will fight you to your death in order to stay the breeding male. Gray wolf packs have highly organized social structure. And, and because of this, they're able to enjoy a lot of cooperation when they're hunting, when they're communicating, when they're defending territory. So as Chris mentioned, it's, it's, yeah, it's not this aggression type thing. They, uh, they basically have a few rules and, the pack is made up of leaders and followers, and there's usually not a lot of challenging or uh, or problems because they they follow this this strict line and are very very organized with it. Um, and the other thing too is the breeding pair they mate for life, so it's it you know works really well for them. And once in a while, it can happen where a pack might be missing the dominant male or female and um, some sibling rivalry or um, a lone wolf or might come in or something like that. But it's, it's definitely different than some of the other gregarious species that we covered as far as, yeah, there's not this, this huge aggression. Um, they can, uh, they communicate very effectively and, and you know, who's dominant by the way they carry their tails and the way they stand. And then, the animals that are submissive uh, do that in a very obvious way. I mean, just 
If you just think of a, your dog, there's a couple ways for them to be submissive. They can be actively submissive, which is by uh, crouching, licking, tucking their tail, and basically saying like, hey, you know, I'm a puppy, I'm here, or I'm a, I'm a little one, or I, I definitely understand that you're top dog or top wolf. And then there's even more passive submission uh, maneuvers such as laying, you know, laying on your back and showing your belly, which is probably the most submissive you can be because obviously that's when you're, you're very, very vulnerable, right? If you're, if your underbelly is exposed to potentially a, you know, to a potentially dominant animal, but no issues ever happen because they get it and they know the language and they have great communication as far as Chris and I are used to horses and that communicate a lot with their ears and their body language mm-hmm. and just a one subtle little movement of a horse. And Chris and I can almost predict what it's going to do or what it's, I don't want right. to say, I don't say, I don't, I don't want to say what it's thinking because that's, uh, that's a, opening a different can of worms. But, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's similar with wolves. If, you know, if they're angry, they might stick their ears straight up and maybe show a little bit of teeth. Um, but also, if they're scared, they might flatten their ears against their head. Um, or if they're playful, they'll, they might bow or uh, dance around a little bit and, and do a little chasing. So from a viewing perspective, Chris always jokes that I love watching horses and they're so boring because they pretty much eat 16 hours a day. <laughs> I would have to say that uh, if I ever got to do a wolf study and that's definitely on my bucket list sometimes to just go out and watch wolf behavior. It seems like it'd be a lot more interactive, a lot more fun, a, a lot you get to see a lot more action and interaction among individuals that are in the pack. And a great wolf pack can be anywhere from 2 to 30 individuals. But the average, the going average right now is about 5 to 8. So, uh and because they're this highly organized social structure, they, they just have, they have to be able to communicate and they communicate obviously different than you, you or I, like we might wave hello or say hi. They have different, different ways of, of greeting each other and all lot in their body language and facial expressions. And they can do things like chin touching or rolling over or crouching. And as any dog owner knows, they can definitely have subtle face exp- facial expressions where you yeah you can tell if they're happy or sad or laid back or sleepy and of course the other pack members are very keen to learn to read that behavior from the time they're pups to to growing up to adults but in addition to of course body language or facial movements and things like that there's a lot of vocal communications which is where we get into the oh 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 the howling mm-hmm, mm-hmm, which of course mm-hmm. they're famous for and, but they do a lot more than howl, right? Uh, howl, howling is just one form of communication. And so, Chris, what do you think? Do they howl at the moon or don't they? Uh, I, I mean, I, uh, sure. <laughs> I well, that's yes. a safe answer. I mean, because I can't say that there's no record of a wolf howling during a full moon. Of course, there's record of that somewhere. But I don't think they're howling at the moon or because the The moon moon is full. What they're doing when they howl, whether it's during a full moon or a half moon or a quarter moon, whatever it is, or uh, autumn moon or something like that, uh, Mm -hmm. or super moon. We have those sometimes. Those are pretty cool. Uh, They're basically saying this is my territory and they may be saying stay away and or their members could be apart. And they could be saying, hey, mm-hmm. this is where I'm at. Uh, come over this way. Because a wolf's howl can carry for miles too. So yeah. it can it can talk to other groups and say, this is where we live and this is where you don't live. Or it can say, hey, Susie Cusy wolf, well, I wanna, this is where I'm at type deal. And so. Yeah. And I, and I want to, I want to qualify my answer too, because think about <laughs> it. Okay. Let's say, let's just take the scientific I, approach. Oh, not Chris, just, you me up. Yes. Tell me why <laughs> no, you're no, right, please. Okay. No, no, no. Think about it. It's not that it's think about, it's a lot brighter at a full moon or when the moon's almost full 
So they may be more active during a full moon because they may be more successful hunting or out protecting their territory. So maybe, maybe, I don't know, you know, maybe scientists can correct me if I'm wrong, but during, you know, hours of darkness, they're less active when it's really dark, less moon. But then when the moon's full, it's so bright and they can go out hunting and do other things. So maybe they're just more active. And so there's a little bit more howling during that period. That would be my hypothesis. I see your hypothesis and I challenge you to find some data to support <laughs> it, my friend. <laughs> okay, I will. I'll try. I'll try. I'll go out in the field. Me and Corbin, we're going Idaho. I, that would be right. a fun one to like, if somebody would pay for me yeah. to go like camping on a full moon versus when it's dark, yeah. sign me up. I would, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But they're known for their howling and the howling is gorgeous and beautiful and music to my ears. Um, I was lucky enough to rescue a husky years ago and mm -hmm. Sinatra, he, I could get him going if I started. And, and so, yes, I just, it's, it just is like music to my ears and, but they, but they also do a lot of other vocalizations. They bark, they whimper, they growl, uh, it barks often a warning, which we obviously anybody with a watchdog, like my gypsy girl, uh, know that, um, a whimper, maybe a sign of submission or help. Uh, and so, or for pups and things like that. So they have a lot of different vocal communications besides just the howling in order to talk to each other. But I think the vocalizations coupled with the body language and the facial expressions and the body posturing, whether it's more submissive or more dominant, more leader-like, really mm -hmm. helps keep the groups in check with knowing uh, basically who are, you know, where, where they stand. But with that being said, I think there's still definitely a lot of doors that need to be open as far as their social structure and communication and their intelligence. I mean, we know they have all of these things. They're highly intelligent, highly social, and we'll get to their cooperative hunting strategies here shortly when Chris gets into nutrition. And recent studies are starting to highlight uh, different whale and dolphin communication and how it's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for lack of better words, like a language, if you will. And so I don't know if we're quite there yet with wolves, but I do know that uh, more that we need to explore more about them and to understand our, to, uh, our furry buddies, man, uh, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's still a lot to unlock. And yes, if we, take them off the Endangered Species Act and delist them here in the United States and perhaps in other countries as well, we're going to miss out on, on this amazing behavior in their social uh, culture, even if you will. I know you, you were going to maybe yeah, talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah. You want me to, I can jump into it. Cause I, you know, we, we started talking about this in the Orca episodes and you know, we had to do orcas over two because they were just so amazing. And the things we learned, and this is where we first broached this idea of culture in, a, in an animal other than a human being. And, you know, so the first thing I went and looked at, because I started seeing this in some of the literature talking about behaviors and, you know, looking at definitions of culture and, and how scientists define it, or, you know, I guess psychologists or whoever studies this stuff. and you know, here's, here's some definitions that, that again, to refresh your memory on what culture is. So culture in its broadest sense is cultivated behavior that is totality of a person or animal. I'll put animal in there. Learned, accumulated experience, which is socially transmitted or more briefly behavior through social learning. And so we talked about that in orcas and we said, yes. Okay. We'll see if that applies to wolves. Then another definition is culture is the sum of total of the learned behavior of a group that are generally considered to be the tradition of that people or animal and are transmitted from generation to generation. So knowledge being transferred through teaching and learning, right? So like, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. So with wolves, like orcas, yes, they're, they totally show evidence of culture. As an animal, right. you know, not other than a human being. And that's what gets me, you know, especially when you talk about now African painted dogs and how they behave. 
Now we see it in orcas. Now we're seeing it, you know, we know in, in the higher primates, we have culture. So wolves specifically, they're very complex, very intelligent animals. They play, like you said, they have these tight social bonds. They are, you know, incredible in educating their young and caring for their young. They take care of injured pack members, just like the painted dogs do. Wolves do that too. And they just, they have such tight social bonds. So it's these dynamics of these social animals are showing us things that this knowledge is not just passed down from one generation. It's from generation to generation to generation. You know, so the older wolves will actually teach the younger wolves how to hunt, of course. Mm -hmm. how to do this. And they develop this culture in a pack. So like we talk about, in, again, you know, referencing this episode we have coming out on Thursday, when we go out and shoot and kill the pack leaders, you devastate that social group. You devastate. It's just like any, just even human beings, you know, our own families, our own cultures, our own little packs that we, we have. So, you know, we have to really start taking these animals and, and we have to look at them through a different lens than they're just these vicious animals behaving on instinct and they just act the way they do because their genetics is so wrong and so false. And how deep does that go? So I'm going to be looking at this in other species we cover, you know, going down to, you know, I don't know, the most primitive, we, you know, I don't think they have culture, but looking at a jellyfish. Yeah. I was going to say honeybees. How much intelligence is there? I know there? they're very social. I don't know yeah. a lot about them. My, my entomology has a lot to be mm -hmm. desired. I know people, a couple of people have requested right. us to do insect, insects and I'm like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> we you better have to donate now. a little bit more money on Patreon for that because uh, <laughs> it would be ugly to get there. Yeah, I could, we could yeah. get there. I know I, and I would actually really yeah. love to, you know, whenever we've done the invertebrate episodes or reptiles yeah. and birds, slightly a little bit more out of my comfort zone, I have, boy, yeah, if somebody would just pay me to learn and talk about animals all day, mm -hmm. hint, hint, mm -hmm. hint, hint, mm -hmm. somebody who's yeah. ever listening, Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio. Uh, DiCaprio then, yeah. Yes, awesome. But until then, yeah, no, I got to stick with what I know. But you bring right. up really, really good points, Chris. And I think that also complement my point is I think we don't know, or um, Franz de Waal's uh, uh, animal behavior researcher slash guru slash God amongst mm -hmm. men mm -hmm. and women uh, guy that I follow, of course, on Facebook. Yeah, you know, he's kind of come up, come out with. I don't know if it's a book. I'm not doing him justice, so hopefully he's not listening. But his whole yeah. new concept is that perhaps humans aren't intelligent enough to know how to measure the intelligence of animals. And I know we touched right. on that in octopus, right? Because I always joke, almost like, oh, mm -hmm. if an octopus had a backbone, they'd rule the world. Right. And they're so alien right. and they're so intelligent and just maybe in, in ways that we can see and measure, but even more so probably in ways that we don't even understand how to measure. And that's why we have to keep fighting for the wolves because we have to stick up for them and know that we want to learn more about them. And I've, I always, I'm teaching an animal behavior class this fall. And in one of my opening slides, I, I always start with a why care, right? Um, besides you need this credit mm -hmm, to pass mm -hmm. whatever uh, this course is it's because whenever I really learn about animal behavior and study it and take it and uh, reflect on it, I actually learn a lot about myself. Absolutely agree with you. I cannot, the more I learn about these animals, these multiple species across the planet, in our oceans, on our lands, uh, the more I'm amazed. And you know, I just think we have to change global consciousness, you know, and that's what we're fighting for. And, you know, the, the other people out there fighting every day for these animals and educating. So 100% agree, Angie, the great point, great point. Now we talk about what wolves eat. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, car you know, carnivores, they, they're meat eaters. We know that they primarily prey on herbivores or ungulates. So white-tailed deer, elk, moose, caribou, bison, sometimes musk oxen, you know, uh, some sheep, mountain goats, things like that. Typically what they go for livestock. Yes, unfortunately, sometimes, but that, like Angie said in the beginning, that's not what they primarily go for. That's not what they're out there to hunt. 
Now they do sometimes eat smaller, medium sized mammals, beavers, some rabbits or hares if they can, sometimes even birds if, if they can get it. But generally they go for the large herbivores. They've seen them catch fish. Cool. I didn't Canada. know that. So yeah. Man. Yeah. So they can try to catch fish. And then if th- there's That's nothing it. fresh, Anybody who's they'll, ever they'll fished eat. before, it's try. <laughs> Most time it's not successful. No, no, no. Right. And so they catch fish and then, you know, they'll eat a carcass if it's there and they don't have any other fresh meat. So typically not carry on eaters, but, but they will, they will. Um, but I remember seeing some amazing footage of them hunting. I mean, just, they can go for days, right? Well, yeah, Chris, what I came across had gave me a little bit of giggles thinking about my, um, my gypsy girl is that, uh, now she of course eats every day and, um, twice a day, sometimes three times a day if I'm home. And, but wolves are a little bit different. They sometimes because of hunting and they're not always successful when they hunt, uh, they might go several days without a meal, which would not have a gypsy girl that would just, <laughs> she would let me know about it. My goodness. I know. Uh, Xander's I know, feeding I know. her. And I think one evening he forgot. And I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I had to, uh, she reminded me, let's just put it that way. I'm like, gosh, yes, why yes. does she just keep nosing yes, yes. me and rubbing on me and yeah, panting yeah. every time I walk past the, the food bowl? Uh, but in general, wolves can survive on two and a half pounds of food per day, but actually need more to thrive and reproduce up five to 10 pounds a day on average. And of course, one of the interesting behaviors they're known for is that when feeding their young, when wolves feed their pups, they actually regurgitate chewed up food um, for their pups mm-hmm. when they come back mm-hmm. to the den. So it's kind of like uh, wet food, right? Like if, you're, if you feed your pets yeah, canned yeah, wet food, yeah. right? So that's what the pups get yeah. once they're starting to be weaned from the mother's milk. And uh, so, yeah, but man, of course, for me as a behaviorist, the big question for me is, well, how, you know, how do they hunt? Um, and what is their strategy? Because we talked a lot about their social hierarchy organized system. Well, a that comes into play for a lot of their hunting. They are known as strategic cooperative hunters. And the way they bring down prey is to work in this cooperation together to be more successful, right? To increase the likelihood that they're actually able to outrun a deer or an elk or things like that. Um, And they have three main styles that they do uh, when they hunt together in a pack. And the first one's called heading off the fleeing prey. So you played football, so you could probably describe it better, right? Mm-hmm. Is, it, is that like a block, basically, like a push and a block? No, the heading off the prey. So you just take an angle where you know you try to cut them off at the pass, right? So okay. you, you find there the you right angle. My, you're my yeah. football guy. Yeah. yeah okay. So you, when a running back's running down the sideline or something, you take an angle at them so you can meet them at a point downfield, hopefully. Right. So there's some like geometry and math right. involved. Right. So yeah, spatial right. awareness, right? Mm-hmm. So talk mm-hmm. about intelligence, yeah. spatial awareness. All right. So that's one way. Um, the other one is ambushing. And that's when one or more uh, wolves hide and wait for the other pack members to chase the prey towards them. So yeah, pretty, give me yeah. a football analogy for that, Chris. Uh, it's trick play. I don't know. Cooperative <laughs> again, but that's, <laughs> yeah. but you know, it's even but when. Think about that. Think about, yeah. okay, which two are hiding? Where are yeah. they hiding? How do, how do you know if you're a hider or a pusher? Like, right. A, a bee, I think is, Dr. Rasmussen called him beaters. And remember, he did say, because you said the one thing you wanted to learn most. Yes. And you said this in the African Dog Podcast was how do they communicate? Correct. And you're like, how do you I know need if that you're answer. Hiding in, yeah. And, and how he said, do you know if you're uh, hiding? Is your job this week to hide in the bush or to chase? After yeah. Them? So he said they actually have a, a really good walkie talkie system. And then, no. <laughs> he <laughs> they said have, they have. <laughs> <laughs> they have their like football pl- wristband plays all yeah, written out that they flip he's, up before the move. He's he's been studying them for close to forty years and he still doesn't know how they communicate Ow. that. No, he still doesn't. Still doesn't. So there, there's so your calling. There you go. Talk yeah. about intelligent. Right. The god, the man uh, of the African painted, painted dog, dog. The Jane know. Goodall. The Jane Goodall of of these wild painted dogs does not know how they communicate so, on the hunt. They okay, just, it baffles so, them. It wow. baffles them. Well, 
there we'll have to see if we can find a wolf specialist, a gray wolf specialist to see if they can shed some light on this right, uh, about right. uh, for this. So that's number two style ambush. The other one is quite fascinating is number three style of cooperative hunting behavior is called relay running. And that's basically a, a continuous chase in which pack members take turns playing different roles in the chase um, for a, a group collective behavior how they know who's the lead chaser or who's going to maybe rest and come in at what point. I don't know if we know that. I don't think right. we do. Right. But right. the wolf biologist, his name is uh, Dr. Dave Mack. He's been studying them for years and years and years and um, has a lot of, I was reading a lot of his papers about it and a lot of the stuff comes from that. He thinks these different styles imply and or suggest the use of foresight, understanding, and planning. Now, as a scientist, like I said to you earlier with your hypothesis about, what was that about again? But right, that when it's brighter, they're more active. Right, you know, so, so your hypothesis is about you get... the moon, right? So right. I said, show me right, the money, right. show me the data, right? Right, uh, right, right. So uh, Mr. Mech here, understands as a scientist that there's not a lot of actual documentation to know. I mean, how do you prove foresight in a wolf? How do you, uh, you know, how do you prove understanding? How do you prove planning? Um, so, I mean, I think that that's, it's, it's super subjective, right? It's hard to study to know exactly what wolves are thinking, but Mech and his colleagues did uh, have a study in 2007 where they looked at Arctic wolves and they saw them making a two-pronged approach to a herd of musk, musk, musk oxen. And on other occasions, he saw them ambushing musk, ox, musk oxen. And so the way they describe this cooperative hunting su seemed to suggest evidence that they had foresight in the way that they moved in on and, and or ambushed the musk oxen. Mm -hmm. That there must have been somehow some kind of planning, just the way that it was set up. And of course, a lot of intelligence and um, personality and things like that is documented in Wolves Under Human Care. But uh, I think we need more of this in uh, free ranging or wild wolves, which is another reason to help save them, right? And to fight for wolves because we still. Yeah, we know we know they're super intelligent, but yeah, I mean, if if these biologists have been studying for 30, 40 years, don't exactly know how they're doing it um, or the depths of cognition it takes, then somebody needs to. We got to figure it out. Right, uh, right. But I did find a new Christmas present for anybody who's listening out there in the world. Hint, hint, husband John, um, <laughs> who's not listening probably. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyways... Um, uh, Dave Mech, it's M-E-C-H. Uh, maybe we'll put a, show, a link on our show notes. And so Dr. Mech wrote this book called Wolves on the Hunt that probably answers a lot of these questions we have. I don't know specifically about how they communicate it. So maybe we'll have to get him on here to see if he can answer the question, my dying question mm -hmm. about how specifically they're able to talk, which I know they don't talk, but how they communicate with one another in order to plan these different strategies as far as uh, cooperative hunting goes. It's just, it's like my new favorite area of study that I don't study, but I want to study. I just, if I, if I could go back mm -hmm, and do it all mm -hmm. again, um, as much as I love my horses and my herbivores, uh, this cooperative, cooperative hunting stuff is just, it's just fascinating to me. Just, and just incredible. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and oh, I also love amazing. things that we don't know the answers to or a lot, or it's not really well known. So any young budding biologist, wolf biologist out there, go dedicate your life to answering this and let me know. Let me know what you find out. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we have a lot of uh, young conservation scientists that are or They're students. They're going to save the world, man. That, you know, yes. You know, shout out to Quinn. We always got to give a right. shout out to Quinn. You know, she, that's one of our younger ones up and coming. And, you know, some of the others, the, the students that, that have emailed us that are want to work into conservation biology. So please, please keep going down that path. We need you. The wolves need you. Now reproduction. Yeah, they do. Reproduction. I mean, we've covered canid reproduction. Sure. Pretty yeah, similar, I, I'd yeah, assume. I think there's yeah. the key, um, the key highlights are that the, um, the dominant pair is the breeding pair. 
uh, in a pack and they're monogamous. So they mate for life. Um, now if there is a death of a partner, um, they're, they will, they usually will partner up over time with, with a different one, but for the most part, very monogamous, which is, uh, I always think is really, really cool in the animal world. And, um, when uh, the females are in estrus and it's, it is, um, time for the male to breed them, they have really cute courtship behaviors, um, where they snuggle and they're, they're seen often walking together and laying together more. And, and so, yeah, it kind of makes me think about humans is that we should all, you know, snuggle our partners mm -hmm. and hold hands when we walk and things <laughs> yes. like that more often than we yeah, probably yeah. do. Um, and then the other thing I thought that's kind of cute is usually right before they copulate, um, they, the male will sometimes, he'll, of course, he'll smell the female and, and understand that she's rece receptive due to different pheromones, but, and she'll stand there for him. But he may lay, he might sit down with nice manners or he might lie down with nice manners. And then there's these cool photos of them standing kind of side by side, but they're looking in different directions, which is just so funny to me. Like they're like, <laughs> you know, obviously some very, yeah. you know, intimate copulations about to happen, but they're just like looking mm -hmm. off adrift away from each other. It's just like, like almost like playing a little hard to get still or something. I don't know. Yeah, but once again, yeah, I don't yeah, want to put yeah. my own, my yeah. own uh, kind of uh, perspective on the animals, but it is mm -hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. And this is the stuff that always cracks me up about uh, animal behavior. In the breeding season, typically it's going to shift a little bit depending on what part, what their range is, but it's usually going to be around February to March and a, a female will be pregnant for 63 days and she has a litter typically that's going to be anywhere from four to six pups. And like no, most species of canids, when they're born, wolf pups are about a pound, little, little sausages, little furry sausages mm -hmm, of love. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they're mm -hmm. born blind, deaf, and I mean, very, very helpless. Right. And of course they need a lot of motherly care until their eyes open and they begin to walk around and build up their skill sets. And pups are going to typically be weaned about day 45 and, and in between full weaning, that's where uh, the pups of course are started first on some of the regurgitated soft food from the, the mother, um, but also from other, from the father and sometimes from the older siblings as well. And as Chris mentioned, when we're talking about society and culture and things like that, uh, they have to learn how to hunt and most carnivores, do and they need you know they need the parental oversight or older sibling uh oversight in order how to do that because it's not i mean how do you i mean you how do you learn all these football relay ambush you know cutting them off at the mm -hmm, angle or mm -hmm, heading off or whatever mm -hmm. takes a lot to learn yeah. those and so there's definitely a lot of uh parental oversight in, in order for an investment in order for them to develop these skills which also once again supports chris's point about if we uh, end up hunting or um, culling uh, one of the the leaders or one of the don dominant members of the pack that has this really important role for the pups. It can it can devastate the whole the whole mm -hmm. pack, right? Oh, it's horrific! It's horrific! Horrific! Yep. And then as um and then as pups age and become juveniles and or adults, they're really not going to be such sexually reproductive until they're about two to three years old. Uh, so. It, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily right away as, as you may think. Mm -hmm. So a lot, a lot of investment, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, again, you only have a breeding pair, so it's Correct. not like they're all breeding. And so we say, you know, going into conservation in the lower 48 States, only 6,000. In lots of different small pockets. breeding yeah. pairs. I mean, lots yeah. of different small pockets. Yeah. So they're very fragmented, very fragmented. And so they're not breeding like crazy and they're not, their population's not no. booming. It's slowly increasing, but you know, it's, it's, it's just a lot of, ugh, it just makes me angry. <laughs> Anyways, conservation, the good news, here's some good news about it. Least concern on wolves right now, estimates of over 300,000 left in the world. But that's of all which, those again, in the so Chris. That's, that's the, the whole, whole world. world. And that's how many subspecies did you say yes. it was? Like a lot? Yeah. 38. Yeah. So it's not it's not rosy. They're not like, Oh, wolves are just fine. I mean, they're suffering in, in lots of parts of the world. 
you know, certain subspecies are endangered. Here in the United States, the Mexican wolf is the one that's critically endangered, protected by the Endangered Species Act. And there's only an estimated 115 left, the last estimate I saw. And that's across Arizona and New Mexico. So, you know, it, it, it's good they're doing okay compared to some, a lot of the other species we've covered. But still, you know, under threat, like every species on Earth. Right. Is under and when you think right about, now, too, you know. what their historic range was and what their historic numbers, I mean, sure, we're in the millions yeah. because they are so oh, yeah, yeah. intelligent and adaptable and able to live in the Arctic mm-hmm. and in Mexico. Mm-hmm. I mean, like dogs, right? Like, our, yeah. and so yeah. if they're that adaptable and flexible and they did so well for so long, yeah, the fact that there's only a couple hundred thousand of them total globally in the world is a little scary yeah. because obviously if it wasn't for us is, and our rules and our roads and our population yeah. and yeah. yada blada, there would yeah. still be, you know, there'd be 10 times as many as there are now. Millions. Theoretically. Yeah. So yeah. 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 No, that's true. It's a good point. So who's fighting for them? Who's fighting? Well, for there's a lot of people fighting for them and that is, it makes me really, really happy. I, I don't, I won't be able to, to name, all the organizations to support um, healthy wolf populations and healthy human wolf interactions. And, um, but if you are a wolf lover like us, you definitely want to check out the international wolf center. They can be found on Facebook and of course on the World Wide web, because I think they're a really great resource. They're out of Minnesota and their mission is quite simple. They just want to advance the survival of wolf populations by educating people about wolves and educating people about the relationships to the ecosystem or the wildlands and the role of humans in their future and how they fit in. And they do great work all about that. And they're fighting hard to keep people informed and educated. So please check them out, like them on Facebook. I use a lot of their resources today because they have a lot of great scientific resources and of course, a really beautiful website that's super easy to navigate and and I learned a lot from them. So yeah, I just check them out. And their website, besides all the educational information, that's amazing. They also have a lot of programs that they are involved in and that they support from school programs to research programs. They have a live wolf exhibit too, um, where they do in-person tours and online educational experiences and they have ambassadors. So they're just really pushing the education of wolves to the forefront and making it real accessible for many different people today, which is awesome. Um, And the wolves there, of course, are beautiful. They have a wolf cam. So if -hmm. you're like me and you like to just watch these guys and their natural behavior, this is a great resource for doing that. And so once again, it's International Wolf Center and they can be found on Facebook, but also at www.wolf.org. So yeah, doing really great things. All right. Well, check them out and, you know, just stay tuned for us. We've got a, some really amazing species coming up in the, in the, uh, the hopper and some amazing interviews coming up that uh, have been conducted. And now we're just waiting on approval for, to get released. So we've got some good stuff cooking from us. Yeah. Move over Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. (laughs) We've got some big wigs coming in. So anyways, thank you so much for your support. Again, check us out on Patreon. That support means the world to us. That's keeping us afloat, paying the bills. And then also check us out on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to listen to the round table podcast with Corbin Maxey on Thursday, and we will talk to you next week. Thank you everyone. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.